When it seems as though everything has already been invented, there comes a time to break through traditional borders and create something entirely new. That's exactly how Amphicar, a car that can drive on land as well as sail, came about. It's still debated whether this was an ingenious marvel of engineering or simply an expensive toy. In this episode of the Infographics Show, we'll discuss this amphibious automobile. The history of this wonder car began long before the first model left the conveyor belt. Work on the model that became the Amphicar prototype started all the way back in the 1930s. That's when the German engineers Hans Trippel decided to test his idea and attach a boat's motor and propellers to a car. But Trippel wasn't technically the first person to come up with this idea. Engineers had been itching to combine land-based and sea-based transport since the 18th century. According to some data, an Italian inventor named Raimondo de Sangro worked on a design scheme for an amphibious carriage. Whether anyone attempted to make this design a reality remains a mystery. But only a few decades after Sangro's design, at the cusp of the 19th century, another inventor named Oliver Evans introduced the design for the first truly amphibious vehicle to the public. This one was real in the sense that, unlike the amphibious carriage, Evans' design ran under its own power like a modern car. The contraption was supposed to cross over the water using steam power. However, it's also not known whether Oliver Evans was ever able to bring his idea to fruition. The next attempt to create a similar design dates back to 1849. That's when Gail Borden created his special sailing carriage, which, to the disappointment of its creator, would soon be forgotten. Another example was the Ford GPA, the most comfortable and technologically advanced amphibious car model of the time, which was produced in 1942 and 1943. This was the car that the Australian traveler Ben Carlin chose for his difficult mission. He was the first person in history to traverse the globe in his amphibious vehicle, traveling roughly 18,000 or 11,000 miles by sea and about 63,000 kilometers or 39,000 miles over land. However, the Ford GPA was a combat vehicle and could not meet the needs of the civilian population. All these examples failed to achieve both worldwide renown and mass production but they were steps that led to the future development of the Amphicar. When the Second World War broke out, it became clear that the mass production of an effective and reliable amphibious car was a real necessity, and not just an inventor's fever dream. Similar vehicles were needed for the transportation of armies across swampland. Recognizing this, German leadership promoted the rapid development of a similar vehicle, and a little while later, the Volkswagen Schwimmwagen, or swimming car, appeared in German army formations. Throughout the war, about 200 such vehicles were manufactured, but they didn't go into mass production after the return of everyday life. Many specialists had strong doubts about the durability of such automobiles. However, the idea of the amphibious automobile didn't completely disappear. It stayed alive in the heart and mind of the German engineer Hans Trippel. In the past, he had been a race car driver, but during the war, he worked in France, managing the Bugatti factory so he knew everything there was to know about cars. In 1960, he finally managed to bring his dream to life. They say that Triple created a thousand prototypes before he perfected the design of the Amphicar. According to some data, his design, under the name of Eurocar, was tested at the Geneva racetrack in 1959. But the producer later decided to make some adjustments and rename the vehicle. Under its final name of Amphicar, the vehicle was introduced to the general public at the New York racetrack in August of 1961. Triple took the design of the new vehicle, as well as some of its technical elements, from the wartime Volkswagen Schwimmwagen. The Amphicar was comprised of the best technological achievements of the largest car manufacturers of the day. The four-cylinder Triumph Herald rear engine provided the vehicle with 43 horsepower, which was considered the pinnacle of technology at the time. For driving on land, the vehicle had a four-step transmission developed by Porsche. A significant portion of the braking system and suspension were provided by the Mercedes brand. During the transition from land-based to water-based travel, a different transmission system would be engaged. This water transmission was a two-step transmission that allowed the driver to toggle between front wheel and rear wheel drive. The two front wheels would become rudders, and two nylon propellers affixed to the vehicle's rear would provide forward thrust. Special additional locks at the lower part of the doors made the vehicle's joints waterproof and ensured its passengers would ride in comfort on water as well as on land. All these features were installed on a frame only 4.3 meters long or 14.2 feet. The entire contraption weighed just over a ton. In accordance with its technical characteristics, the vehicle was capable of achieving respectable speeds. On land, it could travel up to 112 kilometers an hour or 70 miles per hour. On water, it traveled up to 11 kilometers or 7 miles per hour. This is where the model's name, the Amphicar 770, comes from. In order to call attention to the new vehicle and to demonstrate its impressive capabilities, the Quant Group came up with an original advertising scheme. They hired a team of people who agreed to not only test the vehicle in water, but to use the vehicle to cross the English Channel. And it worked. 
The Amphicar 770 found a greater reception among American consumers than anywhere else in the world. 90% of the buyers of this technical wonder were from America. They bought 3,046 Amphicars. From 1961 to 1965, a total of 3,878 models were produced. The vehicle's equipment was the same for all, but the customers could choose the color. There were four standard variations offered by the producer. Fjord Green, Beach Sand White, Lagoon Blue, and Regatta Red. The automobile sold for between 2800 and 3000 US dollars. At the beginning and middle of the 1960s, the Amphicar 770 gained real popularity. Its image was printed all over magazines, newspapers, posters, and cards. Prominent and respected outlets such as The New Yorker and Newsday wrote about the vehicle in their publications. They called it the car of the future and declared it to be a real sensation. Even other large and famous companies turned their attention to the new vehicle. One particular Pepsi advertisement from the 1960s exhibits an Amphicar smoothly cutting the water surface. 1962 was a significant year in the Amphicar's history. That's when future president Lyndon B. Johnson's Amphicar came off the factory floor. They said that Johnson liked to use his Amphicar to mess with his guests at his ranch in Texas. He invited unsuspecting people to ride around the area and would play a trick on them with the help of one of his assistants. The assistant would inform the president by radio that the automobile's brakes had malfunctioned, after which Johnson would drive the car right into the water. However, the technological wonder would prove useful in more ways than for jokes and entertainment alone. A portion of the Amphicar 770 line was fitted to work in special conditions. These vehicles took part in the Red Cross's humanitarian operations, were used by the police as waterfront patrol vehicles, and were sent to beaches and regions with a high risk of flooding in order to save people from drowning. There's also a famous example where the Australian pharmacist, Redford, decided to start using an Amphicar in order to more quickly transport medications to his clients. In the 1960s, some of Australia's population, located at the water's edge, was still not connected by roads to the major cities. It was very difficult to get to these regions, and the journey could take Redford up to five hours. With the help of the Amphicar, he was able to make the trip in only 20 minutes. After its initial wave of popularity, sales of the Amphicar 770 began to decline. There were a number of reasons for this drop. First, special conditions were required for its transition to the water, a flat shore or special ramp which were often hard to come by. Second, drivers had concerns about how constant contact with water would affect the longevity of their vehicles. It turned out that these concerns were justified. Maintaining the Amphicar 770 required a considerable amount of time and effort. Every five hours spent in the water, the car needed to be lubricated, which was not an easy task. In order to do this, it was necessary to remove the rear seats and raise the vehicle on car jacks. And if the vehicle had been used in salt water, the consequences could be even more severe, which limited the possibilities of its use. Although the Quant Group had planned to produce no fewer than 25,000 models, they were forced to stop production in 1963. The vehicles were expensive to produce, and each one that came off the assembly line needed to be tested for water resistance in the factory's special pool. The expensive production and testing nearly sank the company. Two years after production ended, the construction of Amphicar 770 models from previously produced parts continued. The last step of the vehicle's complete disappearance from the market was the switch to new emission standards in the US in 1968. The vehicle didn't meet the new requirements, which meant it could no longer be sold in the US. Deprived of its main market of consumers, the vehicle began to fade into obscurity. After production stopped in Berlin, the Hugh Gordon Imports Company, based in California, bought the remaining parts and transported them to Santa Fe Springs. To this day, that company remains the only place where owners of rare Amphicar 770s can obtain spare parts for their vehicles. Today, it's still possible to see Amphicar 770s around. According to some sources, there are roughly 400 models still in existence. Most of them remain in the US, but about 100 are spread out throughout various European countries and Australia. The Amphicar 770 is not simply an another car in our time. Only collectors buy this vehicle, and the price has risen to over 100,000 US dollars. The International Amphicars Owners Club, based in the US, connects fans of the model from around the world. You can even see Amphicars in museums in some countries. These cars are also displayed in exhibition halls in the US, Germany, the Netherlands, and Ireland. Amphicars continue to draw the attention of directors. You can see the Wonder Car in at least nine films and shows shot from 1964 to 2005. Even superstars have given attention to the Amphicar. Madonna used one when she was shooting a clip for her song, Burning Up. One of the Disney parks even keeps the memory of the Amphicar alive. In Disney Springs in the outskirts of Orlando, you can ride on a real Amphicar 770 produced in the 1960s. According to the park managers, they searched for and obtained parts from part collectors around the world. Thanks to this effort, anyone can enter a retro atmosphere and feel as though they're off in the far-off 60s. The story of this amphibious vehicle doesn't end here. Engineers still haven't given up hope on discovering a perfect design that will blur the line between land and water-based transport. 
So new hybrid car boats are appearing on the market even to this day. Many of them are faster, safer, and more effective than the Amphicar from the 60s. But the Amphicar 770 is the first model of an amphibious car to have gone into mass production. Would you like to own a car like this? Where would you go in it? Hit the like button, share your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Until our next video.